There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to mankind. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the chasm of our fears and the summit of our knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. This is the shipping zone. Okay, no. <laughs> Hello and welcome esteemed guests and passengers, this is your Captain Lily speaking, here to take you on yet another journey through the captivating mess that is Twisted Wonderland. And today, we're talking about ships! In order to celebrate all things hearts and valentines, I decided to make this special episode discussing the character pairings in a sort of introduction guide style? Twist Shipping 101? I was very much inspired by the video Kalei Dust Things did about the Genshin ships a whole while back, where she talked about the pairings as if explaining them to a newcomer in the fandom. That's kind of what I'm going for here, a brief look into the relationships of these characters and what makes people want to squish them together for a little kiss. You can think of this video as an elevator pitch, we're trying to convince someone to get invested in this pairing with us by explaining the character dynamics as coherent as we can. Except that, well, some of these explanations will last a little longer than what a normal elevator ride would take, so for those, just imagine that we're like trapped inside the elevator together and that we're just rambling to fill the time. It's all about the drama here, okay? But not too much drama. And because of that, I do need to establish some ground rules. Okay, so nothing that I say here is meant to be taken as canon. While yes, I will be using canon moments like interactions in-game and other supplemental materials, my readings of the scenes will be wholly subjective and personal. That means I won't be confirming, denying or anything else in between regarding the possible interpretations one might have regarding the characters and their canon interactions. Actions. This is to say that I'm not here to forward any narratives about Ship X being supported by canon or anything like that. After all, the fun of shipping is often found when you explore outside of the boundaries of canon, imagining fun little scenarios in your head that would never happen in the original material. Especially given that Twist is a Disney property and we all know how Disney feels about us queers. But also, I'm not at all interested in starting any shipping discourse. This video is meant as a fun, light-hearted time, where we sit on the floor of the hypothetical broken elevator and discuss our favorite little pairings and how maybe they should hold hands. So let's be chill about things, alright? No hating or shaming or being disrespectful in the comments. If you want to discuss our favorite twist ship, that's great! I encourage you to do just that, especially since I definitely won't be able to tackle every single character combination in this video. As long as we're being kind to one another and respecting each other's boundaries, we're all good. Speaking of boundaries, I'm going to establish some here. For me, this video is going to tackle the character relationships in a romantic lighting. While yes, all of these pairings can be read as platonic if you want to, the thing I'm going for here is explicitly romantic affection, and because of that, some character combinations will not be mentioned, due to having established familial bonds in the game, and it would be extremely out of my personal comfort zone to talk about them under any sort of romantic light. That's just my personal boundary, alright? In the words of Markiplier... Hey, I ain't judging. I ain't gonna judge nobody because, hey, you do you, and I'll do me, and we won't do each other. Probably. That was a good poem right there. When it comes to explaining the ships themselves, I'll be tackling the pairing's history, as in their context and relationship throughout the story, and go through some of their moments, aka remarkable scenes during the events, vignettes, or the main story. They give us either important interactions between the pairing, or they share details about their relationship. I'll also be talking about the dynamics and tropes that can be found in the pairing or that can be often associated with them, as well as some fun headcanons and fandom interpretations that I could find. Some of the pairings might have more material to talk about than others, but that doesn't mean I won't love them all equally. Once I open my third eye to multi-shipping, nothing could stop me. 
By the way, as you might have already guessed, this video will have spoilers of a lot of things. I'm going to tackle the events and the main story books already released in both versions, Japanese and English. Proceed at your own caution due to the spoilers. Another thing, a lot of the information I consulted is from the Twist Facts series by Yu Rei, who are just a stellar source for everything Twist related, so please check them out, I'll leave their socials in the description. With that out of the way, it's about time to get started. Like I said before, I won't be able to cover every single pairing, so I try to stick to the ones I know the most from seeing online. In this video, I'll be talking about intra-dorm ships aka between characters of the same dorm. But if you guys wanted a continuation, I'd be happy to eventually make a separate video about the interdorm ships, aka between characters of different dorms, as well as ships between the supporting characters. Make sure to let me know in the comments if you want that, as well as liking and subscribing if you want more content like this from me, or if you just want to help out the channel, I greatly appreciate it. Now, let's get this ship show on the road. Oh. We're starting off with the ship between Riddle Rosehearts and Trey Clover, aka Trey Rid. This is a very easy ship to fall into when you start off the game, due to their constant presence in the earlier books. On the surface level, you may think this is a very simple and fluffy ship, you know, just two childhood friends being cute together. But if you care to dig just a little deeper, you find out that these two, and quite honestly, the majority of the ships in Twist, have so much emotional baggage, oh my god. Take a shot of water every time you say that about a pairing and stay high. Riddle and Trey have a history that goes way back, even before they've entered Nate Riven College and the game story started. They are, as I've stated, childhood friends. I went into deeper detail about their backstory in my deep dive video, go check that out if you're interested. So I'll be giving the summarized version here, focusing on their relationship specifically and how their childhood trauma impacts the romantic readings of their interactions. So, Riddle was an incredibly lonely child before Trey came along, alongside their mutual friend Chenya. His friendship with them was the only freedom he allowed himself, away from his mother's restrictions and expectations for his future. Trey was involved in the happiest moments of Riddle's childhood, and since I'm going off the assumption that Trey was the older kid of the tree, hence the leader of the little group, you could also say that he was technically responsible for giving Riddle those happy moments, especially since he was the one to give the first strawberry tart Riddle had ever eaten when they visited his family's bakery. But the dramatic irony kicks in when Trey also becomes accidentally accidentally responsible for the worst moments in Riddle's childhood, since he ends up taking too long eating the tart and misses the deadline to return home, making it so his mother realizes his secret escapades. This, in turn, makes way for this soul-crushing event where Mrs. Rosehearts is shown berating the Clover family and humiliating Riddle in the process, which is a panel that breaks my heart every time. Just to be clear, I don't actually think Trey had any fault in this situation. The blame solely lies on Riddle's terrible, terrible mother. But he does canonically blame himself for this, since Trey's act of reaching out for Riddle actually ended up making him all the more isolated. So, as you can see, the foundation of Trey Reed is full of trauma and emotional turmoil. But worry not, because it doesn't end there. <laughs> what does trauma really look like? This is what trauma looks like. Generational trauma, family trauma. You know, generational trauma. Generational trauma. Generational trauma. Yeah. Trauma. Trauma. Due to his aforementioned isolation, once Riddle arrives at Night Raven College, he's not the paragon of mental stability. <laughs> I dare say he's a little messed up in the head. And Trey, bless his soul, ends up enabling his worst behaviors. Trey, my boy, you're not helping. But he thinks he is, because he's always cared about Riddle way too much, and he truly regrets the ways things went for them after that incident. 
This period of their relationship is not exactly the healthiest. Trey is eating himself alive with guilt by watching over what he thinks he doomed Riddle to be. Meanwhile, Riddle is going through seven different trauma responses while also trying to keep an entire dorm of teenage boys in check and keeping his grades up and upholding old toxic traditions because it's the only thing he's ever known and everything else that is good and new and happy gets ripped away from him. So yeah, yeah, I don't think they have a lot of romance going on in this moment. Plenty of angst, no comfort though, if you're into that. But all of that changes when the shrimp rolls into town. The events of book 1 drastically change Trey Reed's relationship. This time, thankfully, for the better. Some highlight moments between them include Trey yelling out for Riddle, Riddle reaching out in the dark and holding Trey's hand as he wakes up, Trey saying he won't run away from Riddle's overblot because there's too much left unsaid. That's suspicious. That's weird. And of course, their conversation after the overblot, where they address some of their issues. Love that for them. From this point onwards, these two have a lot of cute and endearing interactions. In book 2, Trey sacrifices himself by protecting Riddle from falling down the stairs. Riddle calls out for him first during the Halloween kidnapping event. Trey praises Riddle's capabilities as a dorm leader, stuff like that which easily establishes how much they care for each other. I want to highlight Riddle's labor vignettes as the perfect example of a sick fic. Trey gets sick, running an errand for Riddle, who then feels bad and makes a soup to nurse him back to health, letting his thoughts of Trey guide him. The soup ends up kinda terrible, as is the cliché, but Trey finishes all of it anyway because he is a cutie. And then, when Riddle gets sick, Trey goes to take care of him too. They make me insane. <laughs> Other cute moments include book 4, when Trey comments about not being allowed in Riddle's house, which, first of all, is hilarious, because Mrs. Rosehart is really having beef with a teenager. <laughs> but it also gives a romantic relationship between them a sort of forbidden love trope, not approved by the family and all of that. And, in the recent New Year's event, Trey comments about wanting extra money to buy top quality chestnuts for a tart, which it just so happened to be the first tart flavor Riddle asked for after his overblot recovery. Coincidence? I think not! That being said, their relationship doesn't suddenly become sweets and roses after the events of book 1. Both their personal flaws, as well as their working relationship, end up affecting how they see one another. You see, Riddle and Trey are a housewarden and vice housewarden ship, which are pretty popular pairings in the fandom, but this adds another layer to their feelings towards one another outside of the entire backstory I already explained. First of all, it's pretty obvious that Riddle can be difficult to deal with as a housewarden. Even after his overblot, he doesn't magically solve his issues overnight, and that leaves Trey in a tricky situation as both his friend, but also his second in command. We get a glimpse into the relationship from Trey's POV during his labware card. These two are really cooking with the labwares, huh? And it's quite an interesting vignette to dissect. We get to see the opinions of two outsiders towards Trey Reed's relationship, those outsiders being Rook and Jade. Both of them assume that Trey cares for Riddle greatly, Rook going so far as to tell Trey that a strawberry tart made with his love would make Riddle happier and that Trey shouldn't go breaking any hearts. Hey? Hey Rook, what does that mean? <laughs> what do you know? What do you mean? <laughs> what do you what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Anyway, Trey is quick to shut down the conversation, ensuring that no, actually, love doesn't have anything to do with it. <laughs> you guys are crazy. I just keep Riddle happy so he doesn't blow a fuse. Nothing to do with personal feelings. Uh huh, sure, Trey. This coming from the guy that has a historical record of downplaying his true feelings for the sake of keeping the common peace. Of course, I believe you. I don't. And I said no. 
you know, like a liar. And this vignette is a prime example of Trey's biggest personal flaw when it comes to meaningful relationships. He's so used to keeping quiet and letting his emotions simmer in the background instead of expressing them properly that sometimes he doesn't even realize he let them build up to the point of bursting. There have been many instances where he's giving advice to someone else and lets slip that he feels unappreciated by Riddle or stressed that he has to choke down his opinions, while not realizing that he's talking about himself. Trey Clover, the incredibly complex and infuriating man that you are. To summarize, Trey Reed is a fascinating pairing with a lot of potential to explore. Their natural dynamic can already fit a lot of beloved tropes and they can easily fit together with their personalities, but their personal flaws leave room for improvement on both sides. Depending on your tastes, you can make their story heartwarming or heartbreaking. You very commonly find mutual pining and fluff for this ship, but still be warned of their potential for angst. Trey Clover returns for the second ship of Hartslabu, now accompanied by the one and only Cater Diamond. I believe their ship name is Trekei, though I don't know if it's pronounced Trekei? Let me know in the comments. And guess what? They also have baggage. <laughs> Bring that counter up. We've talked about Trey's personal flaws when it comes to expressing his true feelings in a relationship, but what happens when we pair him with someone that is arguably four times worse? This ship is what happens. Trey K doesn't have a lot of history before they read in college, as Skater is the odd one out from the Hartslabu gang by being the only one not born in the Queendom of Roses. Still, by being the same grade, this means that the two of them have had three years worth of history, even being roommates at some point. That's right, roll the clip. And they were roommates. God, they were roommates. However, over the course of the story and events, Trey and Cater have a lot of important moments that show us the many sides of their relationship. Starting off with the main story, Cater and Trey are always glued to the hip during the entirety of book one, since they're the ones responsible for keeping the dorm members sane while Riddle explodes in the background. At the ending celebration, Trey reveals that he figured out about Cater not liking sweet things, and offers to make him a quiche for the next party. There's some translation changes here, but this conversation also reveals that Cater is aware about Trey's habits of not saying what he truly thinks, which makes sense considering how long they've known each other at this point. Cater agrees on the quiche offer as long as it's as photogenic as Trey's baked goods. Later on, in his first birthday card, one of his voice lines mentioned how someone gifted him a diamond-shaped quiche colored bright red with hanabero peppers inside, and that it was apparently tailored to his tastes. On a related note, we also learn from voice lines from the Scalding Sands event that Cater kept suggesting for Trey to buy spices, which are things Cater likes a lot, and Trey assumes this is Cater's not-so-subtle way of asking him to make his favorite foods when they get back. Associating these two lovely facts, it's very easy to conclude that Trey was the one that gifted Cater the cute-looking quiche for his birthday, made specifically for his tastes, because we all know that Trey Clover's love language is cooking. This is especially important in relation to Cater, who has a complicated situation with food, specifically sweet food, thanks to his sisters basically forcing him to eat the stuff when he was younger. The combination of Trey being a baker and Cater hating sweet things is a very amusing trope they fall into. Other moments for this pairing include Cater complimenting him during the Scalding Sand strip and Trey worrying slash calling out for Cater specifically during the whole Lord of the Vargas Flies event. I also want to point out that the English version makes Cater a lot meaner to Trey in terms of dialogue, like calling him mom or saying that he's nagging, and going so far as to labeling him as 
as a nerd, despite the fact that Trey isn't even that studious. So yeah, these are all weird additions to the North American version and they are not there in the original script. You'll see that a lot of dialogues and character dynamics are changed like this going forward. I think the appealing factor of Trey K is that, based on what you've heard so far, you'd expect this ship to be a cute and fluffy friends to lovers pairing, just good vibes all around given their chill personalities and tendencies to pair up together in most situations. But in reality, this ship has a layer of complexity I haven't touched upon yet, and that is because I first need to give a crash course on Kato Diamond and his 84 different commitment issues. We talked in the last section about how Trey often holds his feelings back in order to keep the peace in his daily life, but as it turns out, Cater does the same thing, only like four times more intense. <laughs> Due to his father working in a bank and being transferred often, Kater never stayed in one place for too long, even when he was a kid. To quote him, but for all the people I met, one thing never changed. I would always leave and they would always stay. Because of this, we learn that Kater chooses to keep everyone at arm's length, being on good terms and having friendly relations, but never forging a deeper bond with specific people. Quote, like a circus performer who has a grand old time with people from around the world and then packs up and moves on. I can have all the casual connections I can handle and that's just my speed, right? End quote. Um, deeply concerning coping mechanisms aside, like oh my god Kater, get off Instagram and go to therapy. The existence of Trey Clover very much throws a wrench in Kater's approach to meaningful relationships. They've known each other for three years now and were roommates for two of those years. So whether he likes it or not, Trey does consider Kater as a close friend. Plus, let's not forget that Trey is a very perceptive guy. He notices a lot of things, he just chooses to keep quiet about it. So Trey is very much aware that Kater is keeping him at arm's length, and he's not exactly thrilled about it. During the Wish Upon a Star event, when Trey goes to collect Kater's wishing star, they have a bit of banter regarding Kater's wish for more Magicum followers, and how Trey remembers that being his wish during the previous year. Special cute note, Trey specifically remembering Kater's wish a whole year later. My boy is not slick. Kater then changes the wish for for a more generic one, simply wishing to have a chill life at school. And then he moves on from the subject, by talking about taking a picture with Trey for Magicam. But the real kicker of this interaction comes when Trey leaves the room. It's made very clear that he knows Kater didn't tell him a true meaningful wish of his. And then this is what he says to himself. Kater sure keeps his cards close to his chest. You'd think he'd be open to sharing one of his actual wishes by now. Then again, maybe he is, just not with me. This was my Roman Empire, oh my god. Oh my god. I can't. Get out. From this line alone, we can conclude that Trey doesn't enjoy the emotional distance the two of them have, despite their years of friendship. But if we take a step back and look at this from Kater's perspective, my guy was probably shaking in his white sneakers. Because we know he isn't just this happy-go-lucky guy 24-7, his lab wear vignettes is proof enough of that. And I do think he wishes he could just open up to Trey, that he considers him a close friend and confidant. But Trey also represents the very reason why Kater chooses to approach relationships like this. Because from Kater's POV, they don't have a lot of time left together. Their fourth year will be spent doing internships, meaning they won't see each other often. And then they'll just graduate, leave school, go back home to their entirely different countries. The chances of them running into each other after Night Raven College goes down exponentially. It would be yet another connection that Kater would lose, and I think that saying goodbye to Trey would hurt him a lot. So, Kater frantically rushing to put his walls back up at any given opportunity is his very messed up way of self-preservation, to ensure that he and Trey are nothing more than casual friends when the time to part ways eventually comes. And that is so sad, which makes it so good. You know, I am Irish, and Irish people, they don't tell you a thing. Irish people keep it so bottled up. You know, like the plan with Irish people is like, I'll keep all my emotions right here, and then one day I'll die.
On the surface, JK should work given their complementary personalities and established dynamics. But when you pause to look at their individual flaws, you realize that for this couple to have any chance of working in a healthy, long-term way, they would need to deal with such flaws first. Ideally, with a licensed therapist and not the isekai shrimp, before jumping into an actual relationship with one another. JK has so much potential and completely extreme ends, from fluff and slow burn all the way to angst and unrequited love. So if any of those extremes sound up your alley, give Trey K a chance. Just be careful to not fall for Riz Clover over here. For being the game's most average man, he sure has a lot of ships both in and out of the dorm. To finish off the emotional turmoil trio we're building here, let's talk about Cater and Riddle, aka, um, Rike? <laughs> K-Rid? Kadle? Candle? I'm just gonna call them k Reed, and you guys can correct me in the comments if I was wrong. So, these two, where do they stand in the great shipping equation? Well, out of the three combinations of this love triangle, they are the one with the least amount of canon content, but that won't stop us from speculating and having fun. I think k Reed is one of the twist ships that started out because of a media influence outside of the game, and that piece of media was the Alice in Wonderland movie. The Disney animated one, not the live action, mind you. You see, many fans associate Cater with the King of Hearts, this little dude right here. And it's not difficult to see why. Appearance-wise, he has the orange ginger hair, his personality is bubbly and kinda goofy, and it also plays into the theory of Cater being the previous house warden. And... And that's it. <laughs> okay, I admit, it's not a lot, but bigger kingdoms have been built on smaller arguments, so I am more than willing to accept this. A lot of the appeal of k Reed comes from imagining the what-ifs their relationship could take. Since they don't have a lot of canon material to work with, we fans need to do our own cooking. Someone cooked here. It's also very fascinating how Cater and Riddle can be so eerily similar in some aspects, while being completely opposites in others. They both have complex feelings about their family, they both unhealthily suppress their true feelings until one of them bursts, that is. They're both best friends with Trey in wildly different ways, and they both look out for other people, including one another. It's made very clear that, even despite their infrequent interactions in-game, Cater and Riddle care for one another. Riddle's entire dorm uniform vignette is about him helping Cater to study for his exams by developing a teaching method tailored to Cater's learning limitations. Meanwhile, we often see Cater looking out for Riddle, like when he stopped him from giving chase to Ruggie during Book 2 because he was worried about his health and safety post overblot. The juxtaposition of their opposite traits is also incredibly fun to explore in fan works, since Cater is outgoing, friendly, and very, let's say, modern when it comes to the internet and social media. Riddle, meanwhile, is more irritable, strict, and disconnected from modernity. k Reed fit together like fries on a milkshake, an unlikely combination, but surprisingly great once you give it a chance. They're the opposites attract, the popular kid with the nerd, the comedic relief with the reformed villain, the two ginger peas in a pot. And speaking of gingers, there's another combination we can make in this dorm that involves two ginger lads kissing. Give it up for... Is it right to call Ace Reed an enemy to lovership? I mean, I don't think it's wrong, but is it right? Eh, it's one of the few that we'll get when it comes to the student cast, so I'll take what I can get. This is the ship between our esteemed Reed Rosehearts with one Ace Trapola, and right off the gate, you can see the appeal of their dynamic. During the main story of Book 1, Ace is the first to stand up to Riddle and his tyrannical rules that make no sense and cause turmoil for everyone in the dorm. Ace really looked at Riddle and said, screw the monarchy, fix your damn problems, cry me a river and get over it. And somehow, it worked. <laughs>
For all his rude works and abysmal skills at reading the room, Ace's intervention was essential for Riddle's breaking point and eventual growth at the end of book one. From that point forward, their relationship becomes a lot more amicable and easier to analyze under romantic lenses. Doing so leads us to draw a very interesting conclusion, mainly that Ace Trapola is a goddamn tsundere. Oh, sure, Ace, you deny caring about Riddle's opinion and yet you glow like the sun whenever he gives you a single compliment. Be for real now, my guy, you're not beating those allegations. Signs that you are not straight. Number one. You like boys. <laughs> Ace seems to be a mixture of in awe but also afraid of Riddle, as some lines confirm that the little tyrant is one of the few upperclassmen Ace fears. Sometimes he praises Riddle, saying that he'd be perfect if not for the flying off the handle thing. However, due to Ace's trickster personality, it's hard to know when he's being genuine in his admiration or just being his usual sarcastic self, which is something Riddle seems to pick up on, as he doesn't trust Ace at all. We see Ace's cured side come out when he's whining about Riddle being nicer to other people and not him, like when he gets jealous of the dorm hedgehogs and wishes Riddle would show a little bit of the kindness to the students. I'm pretty sure Ace's love language is words of affirmation, given how much he fishes for compliments from other people, and especially from Riddle, since he does admire him and find him cool. Some of their moments can be seen in vignettes and through voice lines highlighting how Riddle enjoys impressing Riddle and getting his positive attention, and how he is willing to instinctively protect Riddle even if the house warden was more than capable of saving himself. Very Trey Clover and Shenya coded of him. I want to specifically highlight Ace's dorm uniform vignette since it has a lot of Ace Reads coded moments. I already mentioned Ace whining about wishing Riddle show the same kindness he shows the hedgehogs towards the dorm students instead, but in this vignette yet were shown a lot more of Riddle's cute and earnest side through Ace's eyes. How Riddle gets invested in the workings of the card tricks, how he gets distressed thinking that they might not find the lost hedgehogs again. Riddle Roseheart, I will give you the sun and stars to see you happy. It's very interesting to see Ace, of all people, reflect on these heartfelt moments of Riddle's, since their story started off with the wrong foot and all. We see him trying to coerce the hedgehogs to come out, not just because he's scared of losing his head, but also because he saw how much Riddle loves and cares for them, and he doesn't want to see him sad. I'm going insane, help me. Oh my god. Oh my god. Hmm. I can't. Get out. Plus, this vignette also gives us a very, very eyebrow-raising ace line. Whoa, we should flash me that nice little smile more often, instead of nagging me non-stop. Hey? Hey Ace, my guy, can you speak closer to the mic Ace? What do you feel about Riddle's smile again? <laughs> Fellas, is it gay to admire your pal's soft smile? <laughs> No, it's too gay in here! So yeah, there's a lot of appeal in Ace Reed slowly coming to see one another's good sides and catching feelings for one another. Ace Reed, in my personal reading, is a kind of pairing in which both sides help each other out to improve for the better. With Ace's rebellious, screw the authorities attitude, I think Riddle could learn a lot from him about standing up for himself and what he believes in. They give that sort of slow burn you find in tropes of the opposites attract, where rivals who don't get along at first warm up to each other through trials and tribulations, figuring out their differences before falling in love. It's a cliché, and I always end up falling for it. But if you're talking about clichés and rivals and slow burns, there's another ship in Harslebule that fits those criteria as well, only with a lot more bickering. Let's close off this dorm by talking about the dream team, the starter duo, the red and blue, the A Deuce. A 
Deuce is the ship between a Strapola and Deuce Spade, and is probably the ship I had the most difficulty writing the script for, because without the setting of the game framing their scenes and seeing them develop over time, these two kinda come off as the most toxic relationship you've ever seen. <laughs> their whole story starts with Deuce nearly murdering Ace, not once, but twice, and certainly giving him two accompanying concussions. Then, they're just about ready to throw hands at every possible opportunity, going together like oil and water inside a burning building about to explode, trading insults more often than casual greetings. Deuce goes through an entire arc because Ace's comments have got into his head and he felt big sad about it. And then he proceeded to make Ace eat his words by getting his signature spell before him. And even so, despite all of that, they somehow make it work. There's gotta be some black magic at play here. Well, actually, I think it's way simpler than that. See, I think that despite all the petty fighting they do, their relationship still manages to feel so genuine. I have no idea if I'll be able to explain this coherently, but in my personal reading, Aegeus feels a lot like the start of a bumbling teenage romance, in the sense that they truly have no idea what they're doing and find themselves disagreeing on a lot of things. But at the end of the day, they're still inseparable, holding a kind of affection for one another that a third party can really comprehend. I mean, we know for a fact that Ace really doesn't force himself to hang out with people he doesn't like or do things he doesn't enjoy. In his suitor suit vignettes, we learn that he broke up with his middle school girlfriend because everything he likes to do, she didn't enjoy it, and vice versa. So he just stopped talking to her after a while. And like, I know this is a story that usually paints Ace in a really bad light, but I ask you to keep in mind they were middle schoolers, probably around 13 to 14 years old. That is completely in line for how a tween would act, especially for Ace. So, if he glues himself to Deuce's hip, despite all his complaining, there's gotta be something more to what he feels. And there is. In his Halloween vignette, he's called out for secretly being a loser with actual feelings, <laughs> who cherishes the relationship he has with his friends, aka Deuce, Grimm, and you. Like I said before, he's just a tsundere. You just need to put in a bit of work to see the love beneath those layers. DON'T DO ANYTHING GAY! In the same event, he admits that, despite his grievances, it's weird to not have Deuce around in their room. Oh yes, bonus point, they're also roommates. And they were roommates. A Deuce doesn't really come off as rivals to lovers or even enemies to lovers, but a secret third thing, annoyances to lovers. They really don't play into the opposite attracts trope, in fact, quite the contrary. In some ways, they're quite similar. They're both prone to anger, they're both loyal to their friends while still occasionally being teasing little shits, and they both have the brain capacity for a single brain cell, which is usually held by you. Their personalities are very much compatible, to the point that even the characters in the story regard them as a duo by default. Plus, Ace really doesn't help his very fruity case by saying shit like people would go crazy over a bad boy. Ace, my guy, are you sure you're just not projecting your preferences? I also can't help but notice that Ace is a fan of thrill rides, and Deuce enjoys the thrill of going for motorcycle rides. Huh, how interesting, I say. I think that there's a lot that can be appealing for a Deuce, which explains why they're the fourth most popular ship on AO3. The trope of a trickster and liar character falling for the earnest and reformed delinquent with a secret heart of gold character. The fact that they're first years and will have more time than the most of the cast to stick to each other's side, growing as people and as a team. The fact that either of them might actually succeed Riddle in the future, taking the housewarden seat and making the other their right-hand man. I mean, who else would they pick? Background character 48? Come on now. Overall, I think that's why I find it difficult to put into words how a deuce works or why I like them. Because despite their flaws and their constant bickering, it's difficult to imagine them not being at each other's sides. Regardless of them being platonic or romantic or a secret fourth thing, I can't really wrap my head around them not being a duo. And who knows?
knows? Maybe that's just what true partnership is, right? Savannah Claw is an interesting case when it comes to shipping, because if you exclude the dorms that are mainly family members, this might be the dorm with the least amount of ships between its main cast of characters, at least from what I've seen in the English fandom for these last two years. And there are a few common explanations for this, the main one being that one of the members is an old man. <laughs> for context, Leona is the oldest character of the student cast, while the other third years are 18 years old, Leona is a whole 20 years old, due to having repeated the grade before. And while there are characters with non-human ages like Maleus and Lilia, their behaviors match the development cycle of the face species they are, meaning that Maleus has the mental capacity of a troubled teenager despite being 178 years old, while Lilia is very much an adult going through a midlife crisis. And although Leona is a beast man, from what we can gather in the story and events, they seem to age normally like humans and unlike the Fae, meaning that Leona is, mentally and physically, just an average 20 year old guy, and because of that, shipping him with characters that are minors is very uncomfortable for a lot of people. There's also the aspect of power dynamics, especially when it comes to Leona and Ruggy. These two are often lumped together in the House Warden and Vice House Warden pairings, even though Ruggie isn't a vice house warden and there was misrelation, but whatever. Due to Ruggie always being at Leona's beck and call, helping out as a sort of second in command of the dorm, which is a fun dynamic, don't get me wrong. The relationship between him and Leona during the story is truly really fascinating, because to the public eye, they seem ready to throw the other under the bus if a better opportunity comes along. And yes, we know from their minor interactions and mannerisms that these fools carry for each other in their own ways. There's also the aspect of the relationships in Savannah Claw being very sibling coded, despite them not being related. For Leona and Ruggy, it usually stems from how they feel responsible for one another, like the fact Ruggy receives Leona's hands me downs, or how he lectures him to keep his room clean and go to class on time, and how Leona tricks Ruggy into accepting his money without feeling like a pity donation, making it so he can indulge in buying what he wants was still thinking that he tricked Leona into his schemes. They're very cute, I am not immune to jaded characters taking care of others in subtle sort of ways, it gets me every time. In the case of Jack and Ruggy, who don't have the age gap or power imbalance found with Leona, their established dynamic is also one of brotherhood. I know that it's very common nowadays for people to look at two boys that care deeply for one another and say, oh if only just sim them as siblings, which is a whole other topic, <laughs> but this time the canon material does actually support this interpretation. From from Jack's point of view, we know that he respects and admires Ruggy, going so far as to want Ruggy to take him under his wing as a big brother, or a Nikki which does mean older brother in Japanese. Jack spends a whole vignette wanting to earn Ruggie's respect, and in Portfest we see how he goes above and beyond to treat Ruggie to a meal he knows he'll enjoy, because he sees him, and by extension Leona, as above him in the hierarchy of the pack slash dorm, wanting to show his respect for his elders. And while Leona and Ruggie often seem exasperated or annoyed at Jack's stubbornness and in their eyes, simplistic views of the world due to his youth and innocence, they're just as often shown encouraging and advising Jack when he needs it, in their own twisted ways of course. The three of them bicker and disagree with each other a lot, and the English dialogue sometimes makes them sound a lot meaner to Jack than the original lines, but their overall dynamic is kept consistent for the most part, which is why romantic readings between the three of them aren't very popular in the fandom in general. Again at least from what I've seen. To end on a fun note though, I did see a headcanon once where it said that Leona was likely one of Jack's celebrity crushes before he entered Night Raven College, since Leona was a super talented spell draft player and showed up in the televised tournament held at the school, which is where Jack would have watched him when he was younger. And I find this headcanon super cute, but also incredibly funny, because once Jack got into the school and was like super excited to meet his idol, Leona 
Jonah was in his biggest flop era, he would not be having a good time. That crush would have died out real fast. That's why they say to never meet your heroes. So to summarize, while there's not a lot of romance in Savannah Claw, there's quite a bit of bromance. And you know what? Good for them. The octavenal ships are wonderful for me and my already bloated script, because since they already have a shared history and a lot of the same main story moments, I get to kill two eels with one octopus and talk about both pairings at the same time. So let's get to it. Azula Shinigroto and the Leech brothers, Jade and Floyd, form the Octotrio, as I will be calling them for convenience's sake. They are another combo of childhood friends, though there are some Floyd lines that say they don't really consider themselves that since they barely knew Azul's existence before middle school, but I'm still counting them as that trope because it's my video and I'll do what I want, mom. The Octo Trio have been together for years now, ever since the brothers discovered the little Azul's pyramid schemes and he showed them his signature spell. Flash forward a few years and they're acting like a coordinated strike force for evil capitalist purposes. Or, well, Azul's purposes are to become like king of the world economy or something like that. The Eels have canonically confirmed to not really be interested in monetary gain and simply go along with Azul's whims because it's the most entertaining thing to do at the moment. At least, that's what they want the public to think, but it's very much clear that they openly care for Azul. They wouldn't barge into his room with a birthday cake the moment the dates turned at midnight if they didn't. During book 3, once they realize something is wrong with Azul's contracts, they're quick to abandon their position at the museum to check up on him, and both brothers are on the front lines battling his overblot form. It's very interesting to compare Azul's lines here with his actions in the Octavenal trailer. Right before his overblot, he's raging about having lost everything, about being reduced to nothing. And if we rewatch the trailer carefully, we see a few frames depicting him holding what I believe to be a representation of the Leech brothers, and once that small sphere disappears, Appears, leaving him alone and desperate, he overblots. It's a very interesting detail to think about. I want to highlight a headcanon based on the original My Little Mermaid movie, where it's pointed out that Ursula might have given two of her hearts to her eel companions, explaining why she died with a single impalement to her now singular heart, and how it's very easy to correlate that to Twist, where Floyd and Jade both have hearts on their signature spells, as if they were each holding on to one of Azul's hearts. The Octo Trio seem pretty keen on loyalty. The altered English text might make this a little confusing for North American exclusive players, but in the original text, the relationship between them is not at all one of a mafia boss and the shady employees. Rather, the Leech duo are loyal to Azul because, like I said, his schemes are always entertaining to them. So, when Jay talks about all the ways he would torture a poor soul for breaking his trust, it's very understandable given that the two people he trusts the most are Floyd and Azul, who would never really truly betray him. Oh, but they're super cool with maiming each other for sport though, like we see in Beanfest. Then again, are you really close friends if you don't indulge in a little bit of friendly fire once or twice? Just like with a Deuce, it's very hard to picture the other trio as, well, not a trio. They're very complementary to one another, Azul's the brains, Floyd's the bronze, and Jade is the scariest motherfucker to ever exist. <laughs> and he's also the assigned baby girl. Because of that incredible dynamic they have, a lot of fans go, you know what? Why shouldn't Azul have two boyfriends? Which is fair, he has two hands. Eight if you count the octopus form. I'm all in for giving Azul as much love as he can handle and then some more. It certainly won't fix him, in fact, it might make him worse, but it's his crimes and his shady practices that charm people to begin with. Still, every trio needs a duo, and this one can be split into two possible pairings. So let's see the differences between them and the appeal of each leech brother with Azul. Jay Azul is also a ship that I don't really know how to describe, but this time it's because the chemistry between them is so great I… well, I never really consider why I like them. In any coherent words, <laughs> I look at them together and my brain goes, yeah, that tracks, bzz, happy feeling, and then I move on with my life. But okay, 
looking at them objectively, they also play into the twist trope of housewarden and vice housewarden. They're more commonly on the same wavelength when it comes to planning and scheming and plotting. Plus, Jade seems to be very in tuned with Azul's more emotional motivations, since he very quickly realizes why Azul wants the museum picture stolen, and he's also the one responsible for keeping it safe when they decide to return it unchanged. However, if I were to hazard a guess as to Giazu's appeal, I'd say it's because their public personas are so evil, it's incredibly captivating to think of them genuinely caring for another person. <laughs> a very cute detail that one fan noticed is that sometimes Jade drops a My Dear Azul, and we see in his Valentine's Day letter that his opening Rizzler title is To My Dearest. I have connected the dots. <laughs> I've connected them. Another aspect, though, that is incredibly compelling to Jay Azu is that they're hilarious to think about in any romantic setting. First off, they're obsessed with one another, as shown by Jade mentioning Azul in like 90% of his cards. Mickey, but you're three hours early. Oh, oh, you know, I'm just obsessed with you. But they love each other in such a messed up way. <laughs> Like, they go to insane lengths to ensure they murder each other with bean bullets. If Bean Fest 2 belongs to a certain ship that I'll talk about soon, Bean Fest 1 definitely belongs to Jayazu. Fellas, is a gay to prepare for months just for the chance at killing your boyfriend on school grounds. They're the kind of couple that will get like 6 divorces and then sue one another for tax fraud before meeting up for a planned lunch date. If one day they were to argue, poisoning the other's drink would very much be on the table, and somehow, they'd still think it was a cute form of flirting? <laughs> Jade daydreams about taking Azul on an amusement park date just to see how much he would hate the rides, and Azul, meanwhile, daydreams about taking Jade on a surfing date to see him eat shit on the waves. They are hysterical, they are the very first evil Disney couple, I love them so much. <laughs> Contrasting the evil energy of Jayazu, we have Flazu, which admittedly is not as popular as the Jade version of the ship, probably because Floyd's biggest ship is with a certain red little guy, but I'm not here to talk about them today. And while Flazu may be a rare pair, it still has a quite unique appeal to it. I mean, come on, how could you not see the potential of taking someone as organized and well put together as Azul and pairing him up with the mermaid embodiments of chaotic neutral. <laughs> Just like with Jade, it's always interesting to see people's takes on how Floyd would show affection for someone. In game, he's very much shown to favor Azul, saying how he never found him lame until he started acting unhinged pre-overblot, saying how he quite liked the old Azul, even if he framed it as a meal, but you know, biting is a form of affection. Going on about Azul's capabilities and strength during being fast, this is just the Octa Trio event, huh? And showing how comfortable he is going along with Azul's demands, even when it's a boring assignment. I also think there's something insanely cute about pairing a very much, how can I put this, physical affection starved person such as Azul with someone like Floyd, who's always leaning on others or reaching over to grab people or, you know, strangling folks. <laughs> His love language is very much physical touch, and you can bet your ass he wouldn't leave Azul alone for like 5 minutes if he wasn't forced to. This is Bob. Bob loves his personal space. This is Larry. Larry also loves Bob's personal space. Since I sadly couldn't find a lot of content for this pairing, I can't speak much on the tropes fans like to assign to them. But hey, if you're a Flazzle shipper watching this video, please let me know what endears you to them. I'd love to learn more. But alright, we've seen our fair share of traumatized ships and also of unhinged ships. But where's the real hardcore stuff? The screaming and crying, the doomed by the narrative ship? Well, alright, since you asked for it, I give you... So, remember when I said that a lot of the twist ships had emotional baggage? Well, if we had to quantify that, I'd say your everyday ship would have an average amount of baggage. You know, a manageable travel size and all of that. Now, if we take this analogy to Jamie Kali, 
then they would be the entire fucking airport. These boys have so many complex feelings interwoven into their relationship, platonic or romantic, I don't even know where to start. So let's just go in the chronological order of moments and see where that takes us. But first, a bit of context. The pairing of Jamil Viper and Kalim al -Sim has some familiar twist tropes that we're already familiar with at this point. They're a housewarden and vice housewarden ship, they're childhood friends, and their personalities are complete opposites, with Kalim being bright and cheerful while Jamil is more reserved and down to earth. Even their symbols are complementary opposites, with Kalim often associated with the shining sun and Jamil with the subdued dark moon. It's a great base to start a ship, I'd say, but there's so much more to them than variations of the opposites attract trope. After all, they're the most popular ship in the fandom by AO3 metrics for a reason, and I believe that reason to be the complicated history they share and how that can lead into extremely compelling takes on both characters. To give you guys the speedrun crash course, Kalim is, in simple terms, a prince. He's not technically one, but he's the first son of the rich and powerful Azim family, which holds immense power over the Scalding Sands and beyond. So yeah, not a prince, but only in like, lack of royalty title, basically. And because of his important position as the heir to the family, he was assigned Jamil as his personal bodyguard, attendant, companion, and servant. Yeah, I'm not gonna call him the other S-word, but it's very much established that the Viper family has been working in servitude under the Azim family for generations, without having a lot of choice in the matter. The nature of the servitude is very much censored in the North American version of the game, which is something I'll talk more about once I cover book 4 in my deep dive series, but I wanna highlight one of Jamil's changed lines from that book, where he talks about his views on the situation of his family and what would happen if he were to disobey orders. I suppose that concept is lost on me, since I've been a servant of the Azim house since I was born. Masters are masters and servants are servants, and that will likely never change. How could a vassal ever be permitted to turn on their master? If I did something like that and Kalim's father found out, the Viper family would suffer for it. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to put my whole family on the street because of my selfishness. It is what it is. That is the fate of those born a Viper. Taking all of this into account, if you look at Jami Kali's history, from their childhood all the way to Night Raven College, we see that these two boys have had completely different perspectives about their relationship and how they saw each other, which is a gold mine for any creative minds out there to make the most heart-wrenching, gut-punching explorations of their relationship. Did I warn you about the angst? Because you'll find so much of that here. It's a movie about trauma. It's a movie about trauma. And the movie is about trauma. The 2018 movie obviously was a movie about trauma. The whole last movie was a study in trauma. Starting off with Kalim, we know for a fact that this boy loves Jamil more than anything in the whole wide world. He considers Jamil to be his best friend, the one that always has his back, the only person that would never, ever betray him. No one tell him. <laughs> I've seen that when assigning the fell first and fell harder trope for this pairing, Kalem is often the one that fans agree would have fallen first, with how easily he loves Jamil and runs back to his side after the overblot. Though, depending on your preferences, it's very interchangeable who could fit in which spot. Kalem trusts Jamil wholeheartedly, seeing as his conviction towards him was proven stronger than even Jay's truth serum signature your spell. Let's just ignore the small plot hole in book 2 of him being more than willing to share Jamil's signature spell, just duct tape that. Kalim, for all his cheerful mannerisms, has so many unresolved issues that it almost comes as a shock when the story lightly acknowledges it. For example, Kalim 
hates curry. And the reason for that stems from the fact that once, when they were kids, Jamil poison tested Kalim's curry and was hit with a poison so strong he was bedridden for days. Setting aside the fact that this was only one of many assassination attempts Kalim has gone through, according to him, this was the first time he had seen Jamil so sick and that he'll never forget it, to the point where he refuses to touch curry to this day, while Jamil remains unbothered by it. In fact, I believe it's still his favorite dish. This goes to show how differently these two process these kinds of events. For Kalim, the event was so shocking it made him shy away from an entire type of meal. A very common meal in his culture, might I add. While for Jamil, this was just another day on the job. Because from where he's standing, and according to the laws of the household they grew up in, his life is lesser than Kalim's. That was one of the many reasons why he overblooded. He wanted his freedom, away from the Azim house and away from the obligations of the Viper name. However, Jamil's feelings for Kalim specifically are a highly debated topic. Some argue that he just truly detests Kalim and would rather not be associated with him in any friendly manner. It doesn't really help that there's a running gag of Jamil vehemently denying that they're friends at every possible opportunity. And yet yeah, it is funny, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> But there's the other argument that acknowledges that this whole situation is a lot more complex. And that while Kalim isn't exactly blameless, he's also not entirely at fault for the face of the Viper family members, with the roots of the problem being the Asim household itself and its troubling practices. And this topic is honestly way too much for me to try and tackle in a casual shipping video, so I'll save a more in-depth look for another time. The point point is, I do prefer the more complex and intricate readings of the relationship, especially since there are moments in the story where we see that Jamil does genuinely care for Kalim. It's just more subdued, which makes sense for Jamil's character. To highlight a cute Jamikali vignette, I turn your attention to Jamil's ceremonial robes, where Kalim showers him with so much praise and love and adoration, we get one of the rarest expressions in this game a Jamil awkward blush. We've only seen two of these before, one in his birthday card groovy and the other here. And this one is because of Kalim complimenting him. Ooh. You like boys. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, what he says before is genuinely super sweet, and I think that as much as Jamil tries to hate Kalim, he always gets taken aback by how earnest and loving that boy is, which makes it that much harder to not love him. And let's not forget the biggest act of love that Kalim gifts Jamil with getting rid of the bugs that show up around him. As someone that has a pretty big aversion to insects in general, I know for sure that Jamil holds some kind of love in his heart for Kalim just because of that. We see Jamil's reluctant affection for Kalim start to show off around the time book 6 ends, where after Kalim's very eloquent and calm reaction to his return, Jamil softly admits that, against his better judgment, he was relieved to see Kalim's face again. Jamil also makes progress on letting Kalim help him for once, which is huge, trust me, this is a big step for them. I could continue talking about these two for longer, but I have a deadline to meet, and this script is already too long, so let's close off this ship by talking about their general vibes. I think that, at the core of it, Jamie Kali's appeal is largely due to it being an inherently tragic pairing. Just like with Trekay, Jamie Kali has a sort of time limits on their relationship. Even if they aren't exactly equals in Night Raven College, they're in a much looser environment than the one they grew up in. However, even if in the two remaining years they have left the school, they somehow find ways to better themselves and their relationship, that still only gives them two years of relative freedom, away from the eyes of everyone else back in their homeland, back in their established society hierarchy. And once those two years are up, Kalim will go back to being the insanely powerful and socially disconnected Asim heir, and Jamil will go back to being the Viper servant assigned to him. 
because unless something deeply fundamental about their entire household were to change, Jim and Kali can't really have a proper happy ending. And that's just so tragic! I've seen a lot of fan works that feature Kalim after graduation, where he's more grown up and finally taking up his place as the head of the Asim household, and he somehow finds a way to free Jamil's family from their bonds of servitude. And while that certainly seems like an easy, happy solution, it's not really. <laughs> I mean, putting aside the entire issue of how that wouldn't really fix the implied generations of servitude and harm that were placed upon the Viper family, you know, just all of that can of worms aside, we all know that the moment Kalim breaks Jamil's shackles one way or another, like in the one scene at the end of Aladdin with the genie, Jamil would just fuck off. <laughs> Like, let's say that, yes, Jamil does come to love and appreciate Kalim as a precious person in his life. I still think he would choose himself and his own freedom over remaining at Kalim's side. Jamil's one wish was that he could see the world for himself, with his own two feet, to have some time on his own where he could do whatever he wanted. And I don't think Kalim would disagree with letting Jamil walk away. Like I said, he loves Jamil way too much to keep him tied down like a caged bird next to him. We see this in the canon material, how Kalim was devastated learning that he was the reason Jamil overblotted back in book 4, and how he was was willing to just let Jamil have whatever he wanted to make him happy again. So yeah, even in the best scenario for them, their ending is still often ambiguous. Jamil would 100% choose to go off and see the world, and Kalim would likely have to stay behind in the scalding sands. If you're into happy conclusions, you could say that yeah, maybe many years later they'll come across each other again, and maybe then they'll finally be able to stand by each other's side as equals and opening love one another. Or, if you're that much of a fan of angst, you could spin their love story into a bunch of sad conclusions. Jamil never coming back, them never meeting up again, Kalim being obligated to take a wife because of his duties as the heir to continue the family bloodline, Kalim falling victim to an assassination attempt while Jamil was away. The possibilities are endless. This is likely why Jamil Kali remains as a highly popular ship. The love story can be molded into wild different interpretations, all according to our preferences. They can be an example of persevering love and changing the world around you for the better because of it. They can be this insanely tragic pairing that could never survive the pressures of society. They can be a couple that learned to love one another but couldn't stay together at each other's side. They can be this fleeting fairy tale between two teenagers that loved each other but could never truly break free of the environment they grew up in. They could be so many things! Do you see why I'm going insane? Homosexuals! Damn homosexuals! Anyway, that was a lot, huh? Like I said, Jamie Kali is one of the most complex relationships to talk about when it comes to Twist. But even so, let's all hope that the next pairing is short and sweet so we can all take a breather and relax a bit. Let's see, who's up next on the list? <laughs> I feel like almost every fandom has the one MLM pairing whose entire dynamic can be summed up with a bombastic side eye and by making peace with the fact that whatever they have has no hetero explanation. <laughs> And in the case of Twist, I feel like Rookville is one of the pairings that can fit such a spot. This ship is between the characters of Rook Hunt and Vil Schoenheit, and let me tell you, the moment you meet these two together on screen, you can tell something smells kind of fruity, and it isn't just their expensive French cologne. According to AO3 numbers, they are the fourth most popular ship in the fandom, third if you don't count the ships with you or the reader. Rookville's dynamic is incredibly fun to watch, as they are once again a house warden and vice house than duo, so it's no surprise that they're a very easy ship to fall into, even without knowing their history. Speaking of, let's start by taking a look at such history, shall we? Because I was there when it was revealed, and trust me, the people went off the rails for this reveal when book 6 was coming out. So, 
Well, Rook and Vil are third years, which means they entered Night Raven College at the same time. But the huge plus twist is that they didn't get into the same dorm during their first year. While Vil has always been in Pomefiore, Rook was originally from Savannah Claw. We learn in Book 6 that Rook had always been observing Vil as he rehearsed his script in the courtyard, and one day Rook took the courage to approach Vil with both praises and critiques of his work. ビルが中庭で台本を読んでいたところに私が声をかけたんが裏らかな午後の光の中優雅にベンチに腰掛けたビルの姿は一枚の絵画のように美しかった声をかけるのにとても緊張したよ嘘をしちゃえとても緊張
So unless Michaelis Mouse himself comes to my doors and forces me away from my happy delusions, I'll be content over here in my corner, accepting the fact that they did, in fact, have a little kiss on the stairways to hell. Thank you, good night. That's a nice argument, Senator. Why don't you back it up with a source? My source is that I made it the fuck up. Wait, shit, I'm not done. I haven't gone over the events in Vignes yet. Oh boy, okay, okay. Um, Here's the quick honorable mentions. Bean Fest. Just the entirety of the second Bean Fest event. But to be more specific, I'll highlight the scene showing the night before, where Vil and Rook are just so excited about the possibility of hunting each other for sport, and then their confrontation scene, where Vil all but shoves straight to the side to have a one-on-one -on -one duel to the death with his boyfriend. You know, like normal couples do. Rook and Vil are very Martitia and Gomez coded, which is iconic. Good for them. Look at her. I would die for her. I would kill for her. Either way, what bliss? Halloween, specifically the second Halloween event, when Vil is kidnapped and Rook calls worriedly for him as he's a toilet. But the biggest highlight in this one is when Rook finally finds Vil possessed by the ghost and my man drops these lines. Vil. When times are painful, when times are sad, you can cry as much as you please and I won't mind. I will never force you to stop. But that's because you're a strong person who will always stand back up again, no matter how much you beat down. That is exactly why you're so beautiful. It's nonsense to be trapped by the past forever. Dear ghost, that is not where you belong. Let me see my beloved Ville again. I hate them. <laughs> I also want to mention that I'm using the Japanese translated text because uh, the text was a little bit changed in the North American version. It's not entirely censored, but I do prefer the Japanese text. Across some of Rook's and Ryu's vignettes, we also learned that Rook initially got into the science club to help make props and special effects for Vil and his movie projects, and that he occasionally helps out in Vil's club. He also knows Vil's measurements by memory, <laughs> though apparently he knows everyone's measurements, and that he also, um, has Vil's sense memorized? I'm honestly not even that phased. That makes complete sense for someone like Rook. Have you seen his secret stalker wall? In Phantom Bride, Rook describes wooing someone by writing them poems, and we discover in Vil's birthday cards that Rook gifted him a hundred poems. He's such a simp, good lord. In the entirety of the second Sunderland event, Rook is just being extra unhinged towards his tsum by saying he'll take him to the most beautiful place on campus or something like that, and then taking him to Vil's room. The implications that he has free access to Vil's room are wild, but but not more wild than the groovy for his card, where Rook and little Tsum Rook are in the library looking over what is implied to be Rook's collection of Vils pictures? I swear if I think about this card for a second longer I might explode. And yet, even after all of this, it's almost a crime that they still don't have a dual magic combo after four years of this game existing. I am going to sue Twister Wonderbrand. So now you might be thinking, hold on, this pairing is sounding way too functional. Where is the drama? Where is the anguish? Where is the emotional baggage? Have no fear, my friends. They are a twist ship, after all. Of course they have emotional baggage. For starters, there's Nage's entire existence. I'm so sorry to have to drag you into this, King. But yeah, he's a big part of not only Vil's insecurities about his talent and self-worth, but he's also Rook's idol? Rook's crush? Rook's object of admiration? He's something to Rook, and he's not very normal about Neige. It's a whole thing back on book 5, but in terms of cliches and tropes, Neige can be featured in a variety of them, from being Rook's crush and a source of jealousy for Vil, to being a rival of Rook's for Vil's affections, because look me in the eyes and tell me that Neige wouldn't have a big fat crush on Vil. Who wouldn't have? And some fans even like to make him a supporter of Rook Vil, because she's just that nice. And all depends on the creator's tastes, but Neige is overall just a silly little guy that likes to be included whenever he can. Love that for him. On the surface, Rookville seems like a more stable couple compared to some of the pairings I brought up here, and I think that's because most of the time that we see them, they both tend to act maturely, or just being very sure of themselves and their actions. They're not flawless, of course, books 5 and 6 show their character growth and the painstaking 
breathtakingly difficult process they go through to get there. Vil has a lovely and deeply complex arc and I love him very much. I'm going to save a proper analysis for another video, but in simpler terms, we do know that Vil has a personal journey involving his views of his personal growth, his talent, his acceptance of beauty, and his carefully created image towards the public. We see his worst flaws get highlighted in the main story, but he gives the impression that, by the end of book 6, he's more than willing to work on them and move forward to achieve his goals. We love a queen that believes in therapy, yes! Rook, unfortunately, also has flaws. But don't worry, baby, you always remain perfect in my eyes! This is one example of Rook's personal flaw, being so overwhelmingly passionate about his beliefs that it makes him neglect to see how his actions will affect other people. He views his role to be Vil's mirror, and Rook is so painfully honest and very much truthful to his morals that I think he gets so determined to do what needs to be done, he doesn't really stop to consider the consequences until he's way past the finish line. Another example of this is when he ditches Pomefiore in book 6 to go rescue Vil and the others. A wonderful decision, yes, but also insanely irresponsible of him, as it was rightfully called out by Vil in the game. There's also his infamous choice at the end of book 5, which was the conclusion that needed to happen for character growth, but it was still done in a way that hurt a lot of people in and out of the game. Some fans still call for his blood to this day. <laughs> so yeah, Rook is a goofy little guy and I love him to bits, but even he can't escape the self-improvement train. Even so, I think that a big point of appeal of Rookville is that they work wonderfully well together, and even some aspects of their personality help work through each other's personal flaws, with Vil keeping Rook more grounded and Rook helping Vil see beauty in ways that he couldn't before. They improve separately, but they also improve by sticking together. You can find tons of different tropes and different takes of their dynamic. But one thing that I usually see saying consistent is their loyalty for each other. And I just think that's neat. I love to see a couple being loyal to one another. Because nowadays, the standards are that low. Could you excuse me? Ah! You might have noticed that there's a third member in the Pomefiore cast that I've been avoiding mentioning until now, and that is of course Apple. Just like with Savannah Claw, I think the Apple ships of Pomefiore members aren't really that popular in the English fandom, again, from the content I come across. It's definitely a bit more present than Savannah Claw ships, I think to the point of being considered rare pairs. But most of the people I've seen comment that they don't really feel comfortable pairing Apple with Vil or Rook due to the found family vibes that the trio gives in the canon content, with Rookville being the parents and Apple being their unruly, rebellious son, the Pomely as the fans call it. And I really like this reading, it's one of my personal favorites since I'm always a sucker for any fun family tropes. And that's why I'm choosing to not cover any romantic pairings between Apple and the other two main members of the dorm. It's a personal thing, they're not in my personal comfort zone and I hope we can all understand that and move on swiftly. Cool? Cool. Um, ciao. Anyway, so... But hey, on the topic of families, three out of the four members of this next dorm are one. <laughs> Family, I mean. Which doesn't leave a lot of ship options to go into. Let's start with the least popular one of the two. Wakasaba! Now, this ship is hilarious to me. <laughs> Because there's no doubt that Sebek Zigovos truly loves Maleus Draconia. The canon itself confirms it. He adores that lizard boy. And yet, I don't think that a lot of people see this pairing as anything more than a crack ship, or see Sebek's adoration as actually romantic. I don't think Sebek himself sees it that way. I mean, if you were so much to imply to Sebek that he should like hold hands or have prolonged eye contact with Maleas or, God forbid, give him a light peck on the cheek, I think Sebek would just have a heart attack and die from the scandal of it all. You want him to desecrate Malaise's pure and perfect form with displays of romantic affection? Are you out of your mind? <laughs> 
I don't think Sebek believes Malaise to be on the level of physical touches of intimacy like most people. He probably sees him as a holy shining light above all humans and creatures alike. Untouchable and unobtainable. Meanwhile, Malaise is over here in the corner having a million ships, especially with the shrimp from another world. To give you an example of how unhinged my boy Sebek is when it comes to Malaise, he has a whole ass framed photo of the lizard boy hung up in his dorm room for everyone to see. <laughs> in fact, I wouldn't put it past him to demand people to pay their respects to the Malaya's picture if they visit his room. It's mandatory. Say hello Wakasama to the picture. <laughs> he has my whole heart. I love Sebek so much. So yeah, because of Sebek's undying devotion and how the canon presents their interactions, I don't think this pairing is often read as romantic, though there are some incredibly cute headcanons for it, like the ones that play with Sebek legitimately having a hopeless crush on Malaya's, but refusing to acknowledge it. They're just two reptiles chilling in the pond, five feet apart because they're not gay. Or are they? The next ship with Sebek might just call him into question. Let's talk about Silbeck. So, Silbeck, Silsebe, Sebesil, Sever, whatever you want to call the ship between Silver and Sebek Zigovolt, one thing is for sure we are being so well fed with the release of Book 7. <laughs> I'm going to preface this section with a giant spoiler warning. While Silbeck has plenty of moments during events, I'll also be talking about their dynamic in Book 7 and how it might impact their relationship going forward. However, the details will be kinda vague, as I've only seen the scenes thanks to the people I follow on Twitter going insane about them during the last update, and I don't actually have the scenes on hand, still you have been warned. Alright, so here we have a pairing of Sebek and Silver no last name given. It's Van Rouge. Let's start by going over their history, which once again features Twist's favorite trope to put into its ships, the childhood friends. Since Silver is around a year older than Sebek, I'm assuming, the two of them grew up together in Briar Valley, with Lilia being Sebek's mentor on various fields like magic and fighting, and surviving the horrors. We see in flashback scenes that, since Silver was Lilia's son, the two boys were often taught together, building a sort of healthy rivalry as they strive to become Malias's personal guards in the future. But okay, sure, they're childhood friends, as are almost 50% of the ships I've talked about in this video. So what else does Silvbeck even bring to the table? <laughs> a lot. I'm talking parallels, mirrored poses, inverted color palettes, always placed in a set, be it at each other's side, looking at each other, or having each other's backs. You know how a lot of fandoms have that one ship with characters that like stood near one another for a single frame and somehow spawned a hundred plus fix? Well, these two just never stop standing next to one another, so that already gives us a lot to work with. One of Silver's biggest character traits is his constant sleepiness. It's sometimes played for comedy, but also a big part of his struggles in day-to-day -day life. This character trait led a lot of people to associate him with Princess Aurora of Sleeping Beauty fame. And, pray tell, who is the person constantly shown to be the one responsible for keeping Silver from dozing off? Or that always shouts him awake if Silver's face planted sleeping on the ground? Why? That's none other than and Sebek, which is very Prince Philip coded of him. How interesting! It's even confirmed in Deuce's hometown event that Silver likes loud noises, preferring alarm clocks with extreme volumes. My my, isn't Sebek often shown to be the loudest person on campus? What are the odds? <laughs> Look, the story here just writes itself, they're making this way too easy for me. It's even cuter when we know that Silver feels comfortable enough with Sebek that he just often falls asleep on his shoulder on multiple occasions. Sebek is confirmed to be a great pillow, so Silver's delight. 
I want to highlight two events before I delve into main story spoilers, and those are the Fairy Gala remix and the Glorious Masquerade ones. The Fairy Gala scene is pretty quick, but it's incredibly endearing when it comes to this pairing. During the parts of the event where everyone is watching the heist plan unfold, Sabak just takes the opportunity to openly brag about how great Silver is, complimenting him not only for his ability to befriend the animals, but also his confidence and charm on the runway, saying that he looks looks right at home amongst the fairies, and how no one else could pull that off as well as Silver. He is so head over heels, it's so embarrassing for him. It's even funnier because Leona is like right by his side and tells him to shut the fuck up and stop bragging about his boyfriend in his vicinity. He does not have the patience for them. As for the glorious masquerade scene, without droning on too long about the event's context, Silver and Sebek basically choose to sacrifice themselves so that Malaya's, Idia and Azul can reach the top of the bell tower and save everyone. Their chances of holding out until they succeed are slim, but if they're to go down, they'll do so while fighting by each other's side. And then, this exchange takes place. Huh, I could have handled this alone, you know. I should say the same, Sebek. You could have gone with Malice. Absurd! There's no way you could have fought off this many fire lotuses by yourself. What about with you? Huh, are you sleep talking? You hardly need to ask. What could possibly be a threat when the two of us are united? Nothing, that's what. And before you say anything, I'm not done, there's more. <laughs> and the following scene, aside from the fact we're treated to how in sync they are when they are fighting together, this exchange also happens. Hey Silver, what we'll say we have a little competition to see who can destroy more flowers? A competition? If that's what it takes to get rid of them, sure, but... What is it? I was just worried about how I'd calm you down when you inevitably lost. Sebek is a stronger man than me, I would've kissed Silver right there and then. <laughs> you know the one Pirates of the Caribbean scene where the couple gets married in a battlefield? You get it, you see my vision, I don't need to explain. Now, when it comes to main story development, Silbeck unfortunately doesn't have a lot of scenes in the previous six books, as Diasomnia is the last dorm of the rotation, and only now are getting their chance in the spotlight. But Silbeck took a look at the abundant amount of screen time they would be getting and said, alright, bet! We get to explore so much of Sebex and Silver's personal arcs in this book, and they go through a lot of growth as characters but also as partners. There's a scene near the end of the latest update where Silver's just going through it. He's had a revelation that shook the entire core of his personal beliefs, and he decided, you know what? Maybe you'll just sink into despair. That sounds like an awesome idea right now. My boy hit rock bottom. It was terrible, awful, the worst day of my life. And his too, I guess. But then, who appeared out of the darkness to save him? Who is always the one standing by Silver's side, ensuring he wakes up? You already know the answer, but I still have to show you the full voice acted clip. So enjoy it while I go and cry again. Silver! さ、<笑> だけるな。
たとえ言葉を尽くしても今の貴様には理解できないだろう武器を取れシルバーやめてくれセウク俺はもう誰も傷つけたくないなんと情けない姿だこんな男が僕の兄弟子とは失望したぞ今の貴様の様子をリリア様が知れば悲しまれるに違いない<笑>せめてもの情けだこれ以上の集大を晒す前にこの僕が成敗してくれよ分かったそれでお前の気が済むのならいざ勝負はあ<笑>ああ俺はなんてことを最後の一撃わざと受けたのかセメクわざとだと貴様こんなアホが僕は負けるつもりだと毛頭なかった今度こそ今度こそ貴様に干渉してやるつもりで本気で戦ったんだでも勝てなかった畜生こんな悔しいことがあるかそれほどの強さを持ちながら愛されていなかっただと憎まれていただと僕をリリア様をバカにするのも大概にしろ<笑>憎き敵の子だと言うなら何も与えず何も教えずくどんな臆病者に育て、小間遣いにでもすればいいだが貴様はどうだ孤立無縁でも希望を捨てることなく立ち上がった王のご乱心にも臆さず意見した絶望の暗闇の中にあっても、戦い続けた貴様をこれほど強い男に育てたのは誰だリリア様だろうがなぜわからないなぜ疑うお前はとっくに知っているはずだお前の持つ強さリディア様の愛と呼ばず何と呼ぶのだ僕の僕たちの師匠を二度と苦労するなシルバー<笑>俺は幼い頃から親父殿とマレウス様を守る騎士になるのが夢だったその夢を叶えたい悪い夢を終わらせてお二人の笑顔を取り戻す俺はもう二度と迷わないぞどうか覚えておいてほしいセメクその言葉たがえるなよスバックスバック The pairing that you are. Hi, Edison Lily here. I completely forgot to mention Silver's dorm uniform vignette and I'm deeply ashamed about it. The whole story is basically about Silver feeling bad because he doesn't show a lot of emotions on his face and people made fun of him for it. He even tries to ask Kalim for help since Kalim is. Well, he's Kalim. <laughs> But once he explains the situation to Sebek, he drags Silver to the courtyard to train in front of other people, and Silver's passion is able to shine through, even without big facial expressions, which makes the students realize, oh, he's just autistic, and we were being dicks about it. <laughs> and it's revealed that all of this was Sebek's plan, not only to show the students that Silver is more than capable of showing expressions, but that he also shouldn't change himself due to the opinion of others. He, of course, downplayed plays it saying that it was all for Malia's sake but I know we know Sebek <laughs> This is an amazing vignette that shows how much Sebek understands and appreciates Silver just the way he is but also how he immediately goes out of his way to help him and I just <sighs> I can't believe I forgot to mention it but now I have so all is well okay back to <laughs> pre-recorded Lily <laughs> And all of this is without going into the potential AUs they can play into, like Sebak as a Briar Valley Knight and Silver as the Prince of the Enemy Human Kingdom. 
iconic. Sebek being dense about their relationship and playing into the trope of not realizing they're already dating slash married, while Silver just forgot to comment on it, comedic genius. Sebek and Silver being the union of a fae and a human despite the sides having been enemies for so long, peak storytelling. The angst of the possibility that Sebek, as a half fae, might outlive Silver's human lifespan, just stab me, that would hurt less. <laughs> I also think their appeal has the inherent romantic comedy of Silver just fighting for his life every time he goes to Sebek's room to give him a little smooch. Because can you imagine having to kiss your boyfriend in front of a giant painting of your brother, who is said boyfriend's biggest idol? Oh, they are so silly and goofy. Oh, I'm holding them gently and putting them inside my pocket. They are a set. Please don't separate them. I have feelings for you I have feelings for you the feeling was friendship does this video have a thesis absolutely not I just wanted to talk about love and ships from a franchise I'm very passionate about but if I wanted to spin something out of this it would be how absolutely fascinating it is that we can just grab some little guys and smoosh them together even if one of them is the same little guy, the ending result is completely different. One ship's dynamic is never the exact same as another's. I think that's why, even though shipping gets a lot of bad rap online for a gazillion different reasons, I still get so passionate about it. I'm something of a hopeless romantic gal myself, so when I get compelled by the possibility of a love story, I'm already gone, <laughs> no matter how simple and non-canon conforming it is. I am very aware that I'm easily entertained, but hey, at least I'm having fun. And I hope you are as well. Just don't let the mouse see this video. He'll break into my house, crush my bones, and banish me to the dark dimension. What was that? Hello? Say, fellas, did somebody mention the door to dark... Thank you all so much for watching, if you reached this part, congrats, we're at the end. This video took way longer than I thought to make, um, but originally I meant for this to come out on Valentine's Day, uh, but that clearly didn't work, so I just did my best to release this when it was ready. I had a bit of trouble during the writing phase because, well, have you ever needed to sit down and describe why you like a ship or why you think it works? How about 10 ships at once? Some were definitely easier than others, but I never had to spare so much thought about why I wanted two fictional characters to kiss. Even so, I hope the video ended up enjoyable, and what are you guys' favorite twist ships? Were they featured in the video? If not, make sure to tell me in the comments, I love to read what you guys say. And if you liked this video, consider subscribing and hitting the bell so you can be notified for more content in the future. The part 2 of the deep dive is still in the works, as well as some non-twist content, so please look forward to that. If you wanna ask for updates or just chat with me in general, check out my socials, the links will be in the description, alongside the socials of all the artists featured in this video so please go check them out they're amazing that should be everything so i hope you all have a great day or night stay safe stay hydrated and i'll see you next time